we're going to be in Daniel 4, uh, 27 through the end of the chapter. So finishing up Daniel 4. And Kenton uh, taught us, uh, was, was that only one week ago? All this stuff is leaked. No, that was two. Because last week was Good Friday. Right, okay. Yeah, it's all running together. So that's, but uh, okay, so it was longer. So Kenton taught us on uh, the vision that Nebuchadnezzar has and then what uh, we're going to look at tonight are the results of the vision, the vision actually taking place. It's explained to Nebuchadnezzar what was going to happen to him in this vision he has of this tree becoming this great tree, you know, all the animals, the earth coming under it, and then all of a sudden it kind of gets uh, shaved off and kind of cut down or for a little while and, and set aside and then kind of is rebuilt. And we'll revisit those things. But Nebuchadnezzar is told that he's going to be humbled by God uh, for seven years until he recognizes uh, God's rule. And so we'll look at those things. But I want us to think about, before we get into this, you know, just in our mind, we can do, you know, an imaginary person. It could be a real person. Um, but you could think about the most prideful uh, person or persons we might know, maybe the just attitudes of, of pride. Uh, you could think of, you know, the person or people who are the uh, least likely in your mind to turn to the Lord and turn in repentance. And also we can think of the most powerful rulers on earth, um, whether that's current or throughout history. And that really comes down to, you know, Nebuchadnezzar really embodies all of those, those ideas. And we really see that in this chapter, um, God makes Nebuchadnezzar an object lesson. He, he teaches through this situation uh, with Nebuchadnezzar some really in, important things about himself, about things that Israel needs to know for its worldview, that the Gentile nations uh, need to be aware of for their worldview, uh, who God really is and, and what God's able to do. And this is really a you know, really unique and uh, remarkable story. And I was thinking about it that you know, we don't have the story in Scripture or in history of every sinner that's turned to God in repentance. We just, most of them we don't, uh, we don't know. We know quite a few of them, but um, this is one of them, that God humbles uh, this very prideful, very powerful, very unlikely to change uh, ruler. And so at the center of this narrative, we have the, uh, you know, the humbling, as we're going to see in this chapter and in the next chapter, kind of as it comes down to the middle-ish of the book of Daniel is the humbling of two kings. You have the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar here and the humbling of Belshazzar in the next uh, chapter. And I want to remind us also that the uh, language here, there's a language shift, that this portion of scripture, this portion of Daniel, is actually in Aramaic. So it goes back and forth at times, it's sometimes being in Hebrew and sometimes being at Aramaic. Now, it's all the word of God, and their sister languages, but Aramaic was the language of the nations. It was the kind of common language, the trade language, kind of like English would be today. Uh, Hebrew was a little bit more specific to the Hebrews, to Israel, to the Jews. And so, and in this section also, we have the record of Nebuchadnezzar sharing what happened to him in the first person, and Daniel likely, you know, recording it and, and writing it down uh, in Nebuchadnezzar's own words. And so notice, uh, if you look at just some review here at uh, 4.1, just note the, the first person. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live on the earth. So he's speaking as himself. Okay, I'm Nebuchadnezzar, this is who I am. This is the message I'm going to deliver. Or, or for, uh, for I, Nebuchadnezzar, what is that ease in my house and flourishing in my palace? So there's, he's now saying I, me, my in, in this section. And then uh, he also, as Kenton taught on last week, he calls in Daniel to interpret his vision. Uh, and there's kind of this 
pattern in Daniel that we know that, the, that Daniel and his three friends get renamed. And they're named after pagan Babylonian gods. And most of the time, the narrator, Daniel, calls them by their Hebrew names. He doesn't really acknowledge uh, their, their Gentile names. But uh, when the kings or nobles or officials talk to them who are unbelievers, they call them Belteshazzar. They call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But in 4.8, he, he doesn't call him that. He says, but finally Daniel came in before me whose name is Belteshazzar. So he recognizes, he actually points out, and he primarily starts calling him uh, Daniel. And so Daniel relates to him what this vision is going to mean, and, and it was explained last time in 425, the vision came down to this, that you be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field and you'll be given grass to eat like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. So he's told, you're going to descend into madness. You're going to lose your mind and to the point where you're going to act subhuman, you're going to act like an animal, but it's going to be for a limited period of time. Now God's fixed this in his decree. It's going to be seven periods of time or seven years, but there's a condition. It's going to be seven years until you recognize that the Most High rules not only in heaven in a kind of vague spiritual kingdom, but he rules over the kingdoms of mankind on the earth and bestows those on whomever he wishes. And until Nebuchadnezzar recognizes that, he's stuck in this place where he doesn't even have control over his own mind. Now, he had control over tons of things. He's one of the most powerful uh, emperors, rulers, kings on the face of the earth in human history, both in extent and what he was able to do in his reign. It was pretty unlimited. He could say whether or not his citizens would live or die. So he has all this access to all this power and greatness, um, but it's limited. He even loses control over his mind, and God is really in control of it all. And this is a really important lesson for the people of Israel at this time. Because remember, they're in exile. They thought that Zion was inviolable, uh, that it, it couldn't ever come down. And they thought, as long as we have the temple, God could never punish or judge us, which was wrong. And Jeremiah t tells them that's not true based on what the Bible actually says. And he says, actually, God promises he will judge you and he will kick you out of the land. And he talks about Nebuchadnezzar coming to actually do this. And so as they come out, they have a, a crisis as they're in Babylon of thinking, wait a second, has God failed in relation to these other gods? How do we figure into our thinking and our worldview that this pagan Gentile king, he seems to be ruling the world. I mean, that just doesn't seem to match up with what God has said or the fact that God rules. So God demonstrates in Nebuchadnezzar, really, that in this object lesson, look, God's even con in control of, of this guy. Um, and by the way, fun fact, I've said this before, but when I say this guy, I, I, say, I call everybody guys, but uh, guy is a, uh, one of our English words that actually has a Hebrew background. Guy means, uh, comes from New York Jews who started calling the people around them, the Gentiles, the outsiders, uh, guy, because uh, the, the singular form for goyim in Hebrew, the Gentiles or the nations is goy or guy. And so that's where it came from. So when I call Nebuchadnezzar a guy or Haman and Esther a bad guy, uh, it's actually, you know, proper terminology there. So that's, that's what he is. So God's in control of this guy, the most powerful guy on the face of the earth at this time and in all human history in a way. 
And so we're going to look at kind of two points here, and it's pretty simple. Verses 28 to 33, we're going to see the vision actually fulfilled. And then in verses 34 through 37, we're going to look at Nebuchadnezzar's repentance and his, his really how God changes him. Um, and before we jump in to 28 and following, uh, let me make an application real quick by kind of making fun of what I call the sweet little old lady memes a little bit that... You know, in a time of crisis and in times like this, uh, it's very common for people to say, and we get a little bit where they're coming from, so it's not like we want to be ungracious, but like the idea of in explaining when terrible tragedies happen in the world or bad things, a lot of times people, you know, ask, okay, well, where was God? And people, we have to answer that question, and we have to answer it biblically, but in an attempt to do that, a lot of times people try to settle on answers that are, that are less than biblical, and, and one of them is kind of like, well, God doesn't go where he's not wanted, and God is a gentleman, maybe you've heard that before, and he doesn't, you know, you, you told him to leave government, and you told him to leave the schools, and you don't want to say under God in the pledge, you know, that, that type of kind of homely, warm language of kind of, you know, just God as, as kind of a part of, I, I don't know, patriotism, nationalism type of thing, um, you know, but the truth is, we don't see that. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible... Uh, intervenes in history. The God of the Bible intervenes where he's not wanted. Uh, the God of the Bible sent his son into the world that was made through him and did not recognize him to, to save people. I mean, so uh, God definitely goes where he's not wanted and is, is in control of those things. Um, so thankfully, you know, there are bigger biblical answers to those things than just, you know, the kind of workable answers of, well, God's just a gentleman. Because if, if God didn't go where he wasn't wanted, I mean, no one would be saved. Nebuchadnezzar didn't want God. He didn't, you know, we wouldn't, we didn't want God. So, uh, but, you know, anyway, so that's uh, just something to think about a little bit as we get into this, this chapter here. Uh, but let's look at uh, verses uh, 28 through 33. I'll, I'll, I'll read this uh, section. We can read along together. And then uh, we'll talk through it a little bit. So this is the section here where the vision is fulfilled. So let me read this, this part. Okay. It says, All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. The king reflected, or literally answered, and said, Is this not Babylon the great, which I myself built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty, while the word was still in the king's mouth, <clears throat> a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you and you will be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place will be with the beast of the field. <clears throat> you will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Immediately, the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled, and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Okay, so that's the section there of the, the narrative, but let's, you know, talk, talk about this a little bit. You know, notice just as a preliminary point in verse 28, it says, you know, all this happened, you know, so it, it doesn't happen right away. It doesn't happen immediately. But what God had said, what he had given to Nebuchadnezzar in his dream and had Daniel interpret, it does take place. It does take place in the real world. It doesn't have 
It was a symbolic meaning, but it wasn't some sort of just vague spiritual meaning that was disconnected from the, the real world. It was something that, that was actually going to take place and did take place uh, in history. And so, you know, it does, it does happen. And uh, that's one of the things that today even people even though it's not uh, real Christianity, but it's called by Christianity, you want to say, well, God doesn't really intervene in human history. That, that wouldn't be right. That wouldn't be fair. He's created the world, um, but he wouldn't come back and, and kind of undo the laws he did, you know, in creating the world the way it is. Uh, but that's not the God that the Bible teaches. The God that the Bible teaches is transcendent, but involved with his uh, creation. And so he's very personally involved, and he speaks... Um, and we know he's involved by the fact that he gives revelation, that he reveals himself, and that actual events are taking place to fulfill um, God's, God's decree, God's will for his created order. And so Nebuchadnezzar, you know, why does it take time? Uh, some, now, if you look back at the last section, remember Daniel had warned him, King you know, he had warned him to repent. He would warned him not to continue in his sins, especially in his pride. Okay, so he warns Nebuchadnezzar not to do that. And something, possibly for a time, uh, this may not be true, but it's possible, that Nebuchadnezzar may have kind of uh, restrained himself a little bit in his pride. He may have backed it down a notch, in his uh, kind of self-aggrandized thinking of himself, of his, his arrogance, that maybe he, he took it easy for a while. Or maybe just God's appointed time hadn't come. But it's about 12 months later, and maybe he thought that he avoided you know, this situation. He thought, okay, all right, I, I took it easy, and what God said, what Daniel explained to me, hasn't actually happened. Maybe I was strong enough, smart enough to, to avoid what God told me was going to take place by the dream and by Daniel. Uh, but then Nebuchadnezzar starts a, a building project or, or is finishing a, a huge building project. You guys saw, I, I tried to send a couple times, the uh, picture of one of the, what the Greeks identified as one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Okay, which is the, the Hanging uh, Gardens of Babylon. I've got it out here. And the Hanging Gardens of Babylon is just this huge structure built uh, with this you know, great you know, water system. The, it wasn't just a garden. It was really kind of this uh, city built out of a plain and had a you know, palace and all this uh, beauty. And this you know, it would have been a huge project and undertaking, especially in that time with the, the tools and resources that they had. And Nebuchadnezzar kind of looks out likely on this uh, structure that he's built from the top of his palace. And he can see really all of this stuff that in his mind, and it's partially true, that he is, he's really accomplished all this stuff. And then his wording is in verse um, 30. His wording is he's thinking to himself, and, and the word reflecting there actually means answered. So this is almost like he's talking back to the vision or talking, thinking through the vision that Daniel had explained to him, what God had said. And God had said he was going to humble him, but and Nebuchadnezzar kind of is like thinking, you know what? Actually, no, I, I really am that great. Listen to what he says. Is, not, is this not Babylon the great, which I myself has built, uh, have built as a royal residence or house by the might of my power for the glory of my majesty? So it's all about him. And, and partially he's right. I mean, Babylon uh, was a great city. Let me read a couple quotes from some ancient uh, historians. There's an, uh, one of the 
in the academic world, one of the first historians is recognized as a, a Greek named Herodotus. Um, he writes a, a book called The Histories about uh, ancient history and uh, records a lot of these things. Uh, let me read a quote about Babylon uh, from him, and then I'm going to read from another uh, ancient historian named Barosis, who's a little less famous, but who's quoted in Josephus, the Jewish historian as well, who writes about these events. But let me quote from Herodotus's The History uh, about the Hanging Gardens and Babylon itself. He says, Such is the size of the city of Babylon, and it had a magnificence greater than all other cities of which we have knowledge. So, I mean, this was the greatest city in the history of the world at that time, it, compared to anything else. And this is compared to, they had some, it was the ancient world, but I mean, they did have things like Egypt and stuff like that. But Babylon had exceeded them um, than all the great, you know, buildings and cities that had ever been up till that point. There's, you know, the reason that it was recognized as one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Uh, Barosus, who's actually quoted in Josephus' book, The Antiquities, talks about Nebuchadnezzar uh, and why he built the hanging uh, gardens. He actually built it for his wife. His wife was uh, from an area uh, called Medea. Maybe you've heard of like the Medes and the Persians. That's kind of connected. Um, she's from this area and she's used to like a mountainous country. She likes mountains and she kind of misses that when she comes to Babylon. Babylon's out on kind of a plain, kind of a flat land. And so Nebuchadnezzar builds up the hanging gardens, if you look at the picture of it, to kind of look like, with its trees and everything, as if it's a mountain. It's kind of like a city mountain built out of nowhere in the middle of this, this plain. So let me read the, the description of it. It says, He therefore built three walls around the city, the, uh, around about the inner city, and three others about that which was the outer. And he did this with burnt brick. Uh, and after he had, after becoming manor, walled the city and adorned its gates gloriously, he built another palace before his father's palace, uh, but so that it joined to it. To describe whose vast height and immense riches, it would perhaps be too much for me to attempt, meaning... To, describe, to try to even articulate how great this was would be hard to even describe, is what he's saying. Yet as large and lofty as they were, they were completed in 15 days. Well, I don't know how true that is, but anyway. Uh, he also erected elevated places for walking of stone and made it resemble mountains. And he built it so that it might be... Uh, so that it might be planted with all sorts of trees. He also erected uh, what was called a pencil paradise uh, because his wife was made desirous to have these things of her own country, she having been bred and brought up in the palaces of Medea. So she, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's wife desires this. And, and notice I want to point out two um, important factors there in the description of Barossus. Number one is Nebuchadnezzar tries to make uh, this kind of city and this hanging garden, this palace and all this stuff, he tries to make it look like a mountain. Now one, that's obviously the description here is to please his wife, but remember the vision of Daniel. Daniel 2 has the statue of the four metals, Nebuchadnezzar's the head of gold, okay, Remember in, in Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar tries to build an entire statue of gold and then have people bow down to it to say, no, 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 I'm the whole thing from head to toe. There's not going to be any other kingdoms beyond me. Okay, That doesn't work. Uh, and then remember that a stone in, the, in Daniel 2, without hands, which is the Messiah and the kingdom of God, crushes the statue on its feet and then becomes a great mountain that fills the whole earth. So there's a possibility here that maybe Nebuchadnezzar is saying, okay, maybe I can be the mountain that fills the whole earth. My kingdom, maybe I can really make it so that I'm the one who really fulfills that. 
and that there's not a greater kingdom that comes and replaces all these other kingdoms and me and, and really takes over. That the kingdom of, of God on earth, maybe I can be the one to, to out, outdo that. Uh, his garden is also described as a paradise. Um, this might have been even a challenge for the people, the Jews, in their time to see, well, wait a second, is, if, is Nebuchadnezzar, this pagan, wicked, Gentile king, is he so powerful that he's basically been able to undo the curse from the fall and bring the world back to paradise without God? He's basically been able to get away with escaping the curse of sin and the curse of the fall of creation and that through his power and might and taking over the world, he's able to restore paradise. You know, how do we think about this? That this king is... From what we can see, the, the greatest, most powerful ruler in the world, and he's getting all these blessings. Is God really in control even in that you know, situation? Uh, let me read uh, from his vision, Daniel. Actually, let me have somebody else read. Uh, can somebody read Daniel 4, 10 through 12? This is what Kenton went over last time. It's his, his previous vision. Daniel 4, 10 through 12 says, These were the visions of, of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached out to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, the birds of the heavens dwelt within its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. Yeah, so that's the description of Nebuchadnezzar's vision. And he's kind of, it's kind of being fulfilled now, right? He's doing this stuff, but the rest of the vision hasn't happened yet. Um, so is, you know, is Nebuchadnezzar going to be the one who brings about that mountain kingdom against what God has said, what Daniel uh, has, has said? Was he able to overpower uh, the curse? You know, how... How does their worldview handle this? And this is probably one of the reasons why God included this in this chapter, to explain to the Jews and to the Gentiles, here's the reality of the situation. Here's what you need to understand, that God is actually in control of Nebuchadnezzar. See, uh, and we can be tempted to think this way too, that, you know, how can this be with these empires, these, these world powers, these rulers, these individuals who are opposed to God, who, who don't want God, who don't want his rule over their lives, who don't want Christ, you, who rebel against God, uh, who don't desire God's will in the world. You know, the, how does God deal with that? Is God really in charge of even those things, even his, his enemies? That when God says he's in charge of his world, you know, and there are very powerful people that say they don't want that. You know, can God handle that? Can our worldview uh, account for what's really happening in that type of situation? Let me read the inscription that was stamped onto the bricks. So as they're building this palace, the hanging garden. This was the inscription that was stamped on the bricks. Uh, it says, The fortifications of Esagila and Babylon I strengthened and established in the, in the name of my reign forever. This is in the name of Nebuchadnezzar. So basically, I built the city brick by brick. It's, it's stamped. There was an archaeological dig that found this inscription pretty much stamped on every brick of ancient Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, well, I'm pretty great. I've, and Babylon is great. You know, there's no disputing that. But it's, uh, he's not really in charge. And that's what he's about to find out. Now notice, let me read again, verses 31 uh, through 33. So his notice it says, while the word was still in the king's mouth... Literally, like, as he's saying this to himself, a voice came to Nebuchadnezzar saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it has been declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. 
Okay, so as he's still talking in his pride, making this, you know, have you guys ever done that? Maybe, uh, maybe not, and you don't have to admit it, you know, don't have to have a raise of hand. But have you ever said something, maybe even out loud or just thought it in your mind, said something that was maybe really prideful or really sinful, and you're just like, and then you realize and you're like, man, I can't believe I just said that to myself or thought that to myself that I can't believe like that thought actually just, yeah, so that's kind of what Nebuchadnezzar, as I don't, he didn't have an immediate uh, sense of conviction, but he, as soon as he's in the middle of talking, saying something um, that prideful, that boastful, here comes the correction from God, the external correction from God sent by an angel. And he's told, sovereignty is removed from you. You know, it's, it's interesting that word sovereignty or kingdom, that, that ability to rule over, you know, that which belongs to you kind of thing. He tells him, you know, sovereignty has been removed. This is a, you know, a hugely powerful statement. I mean, just imagine, this is the guy who is in charge of everything in the most powerful empire on the earth at that time. And God, in one second, tells him that power, that ability to rule yourself and answer to no one has been removed and taken away. I mean, this just shows how sovereign God really is, that if Nebuchadnezzar has all this ability and power and might, how much more God who can just say, okay, you're done and you're in timeout for seven years. You know, God can take it away from him and he can give it back and he can set the exact time limit. I mean, imagine saying that today to a president, a king, a ruler, not us individually, but just the God can, and it's still true, it doesn't mean it'll happen in the way that it's laid out here in Daniel, or that we should expect anything of that you know, nature necessarily, but God can remove and does remove people from those positions of leadership in a moment. You know, like it's nothing to him. And so, you know, if God can uh, adjust all these things according to his will, it really shows that he's sovereign. And the pattern in Daniel is kings make these decrees. If you look up the word decree, it may be different based on different versions, but if you look up the word in English in decree in Daniel, you see that kings make decrees, God makes decrees, the king's decrees usually fail, even though they're supposed to be unbreakable in that culture and law system. Only God's decrees are invincible. Only God's decrees last. And so really the question is, who can be more sovereign than the one who has the ability to take away and give sovereignty to earthly rulers as he wills? Uh, can somebody look up, verse here, uh, cross-reference, can somebody look up Psalm 103.19, Psalm 103.19 and read that for us? You want to get it? Sure. Okay. I'm going the wrong way. Yes. <laughs> 103.19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. Okay. There we have it. <laughs> like, yeah, so God has established his throne. So we, and notice he's seated. It's not like he's worried. God has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. You know, there's Psalm 115.3. It talks about God does whatever he pleases in earth and in heaven. That it's not just limited to some disconnected heavenly realm where God does what he wants. And it's not as if it's just in God's own mind where he can imagine and do what he wants. God does whatever he wants. God does as he pleases, when he pleases, how he pleases. Now, there are things that happen that are against the moral will of God. 
God decrees as law and people try to defy that. But God's sovereign will that he's decreed, nothing changes that. Nothing goes against that. Um, you know, there are very few things in the world that we can fully control. Uh, and I, I, as I was sitting down and writing this and thinking through it, I was like, a lot of people feel like they can control their own mind, though. But as I even started to write that, and that's true, but as I even started to write that, I realized that actually a lot of people are acquiescing or acknowledging to a position where even though they want to be in control in so far as God is concerned, everything that God does, they want to be in control of. But they're, they'll say they're not in control of their own mind. Mm -hmm. That their own mind, the processes of their own mind are really something that they, they cannot control. And so I, I don't even know. It, 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 we like to think we can control uh, things in our own lives, but, but a lot more people are acknowledging they're not in control. Now, I don't think that's an admission to, toward repentance. I think they admit that they're not in control of things that they're responsible for, but then we wish we were in control of things that God is responsible for. You know, so it's a, it's a shift of um, authority, I think. But, you know, so, so much of the world um, operates independently of us and our will. You know, we did not make the sun come up this morning. We did not control these things that are going on around us. Um, you know, our will is not the determinative force in the universe, right? We like to feel like whatever we will is the thing that's going to happen. But, I mean, we've got 7 billion other people on a, a planet that we didn't create. And the idea that one human being's will is going to be the thing that binds God or anything else is um, just doesn't make a lot of sense. I was going to say unlikely, but it's just impossible. It's not, not, even, not even in the realm of you know, possibility. Um, but again, human free will, meaning we're responsible, we have volition, we have decision-making power that God has created us in his image to have, only makes sense in a world that God has created, that God sustains by the word of his power, that God upholds so that we can operate in it so in a way that our decisions even make sense, that they're even valid, that we even choose between one thing or another. I mean, it's, um, it would make no difference if there was no truth, no standard of anything. One choice or another makes no difference at all. Um, so human responsibility is within God's sovereignty. It's within God's creation. It's within God's uh, created order and within his world. Uh, let me read a quote from A.W. Pink in his chapter on uh, the sovereignty of God in his book, uh, The Attributes of God, which is a great book. We've gone, th we've gone through it before in uh, several years ago in youth group, but it's a great book. You can get it for free online. Um, I remember reading this laying in my bed and, and reading this sentence, because in his book, he you know, just goes through very biblically, uh, explains things very well, has a ton of you know, just scripture quotations and verses, and, and just in a concise way, in two or three pages, lays out these doctrines of, of biblical truth about the nature and character of God. And he, had, he kind of announced at the beginning of the chapter, he was like, you know, he raised the question, very common, of, well, where does God's sovereignty end and man's responsibility begin? You know, God's word teaches both of those things, but, you know, how do we think about that? And this is what uh, A.W. Pink wrote, and I, I remember this, I mean, this just changed uh, my mind or, or really confirmed some really biblical thinking um, in my mind like that. Um, and so let me, let me read the, the quotation here. It says, uh, Thus, there is perfect harmony between the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of the creature. Many 
have most foolishly said that it is quite impossible to show where divine sovereignty ends and creature accountability begins. Here is where creature responsibility begins. In the sovereign ordination of the Creator, as to His sovereignty, there is not and never will there be any end to it. So, I mean, that sentence just rocked my world when I was, you know, uh, 18, 19 years old. Because then I was like, that's true. God's sovereign. He's the creator of the world. So my human responsibility is within that environment. And God's sovereignty, just like the rest of his nature, doesn't have a beginning and doesn't have an end. That human responsibility is within the sovereignty of God. That really the sovereignty of God is the, the thing that rules over all of those things. That was just one of those sentences that, you know, I remember debating, you know, I was sharing the gospel, so I don't the seed was planted, but debating with someone who was an atheist at AVC who was a friend, and going back and forth and, and trying to work through and answer, you know, this type of question and just wishing, you know, after I had read this and, and seen that that was true from the scriptures, knowing that that was, you know, that was the answer, that really it's, it's God's sovereignty that rules over all. And that because God is sovereign, because he has created us in his image, we're responsible to respond to that, to God's rule, just like Nebuchadnezzar is. Uh, so the sovereignty of God does not eliminate or, eliminate or diminish the responsibility of us as the creatures, but it defines it, it limits it, it establishes it. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is, is coming to this uh, realization the hard way. And so he is, you know, God doesn't deal with every sinner that he brings to this realization the same way. But let's talk here. How long, there could be a couple, uh, a range of, of correct answers to this, and it's not like I'm just looking for an, an answer, but you know, how long is Nebuchadnezzar's condition going to last? Seven periods. Seven periods, yeah. Seven years, so... Yeah, that's the that's the duration of the time period. Until he falls on his face. Yeah, until he <laughs> until he falls on his face, until he uh, until he recognizes, right? Until he figures out that learns the lesson that is it says in verse thirty two. Until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever He wishes. So God's defined the duration of time that it's going to be, but he also says to Nebuchadnezzar, well, it's really up to you. In a sense, it's up to you until you recognize this fact. And for Nebuchadnezzar, just as God knew and just as God decreed, it would take seven years. Okay, some people, it takes... A lifetime. Some people it doesn't take long at all. I, you know, and that's up to really up to God and how He decides to to deal with His people. But I mean, just this is the most powerful king on the face of the earth, and and he's like a plaything in the hand of God. And that doesn't mean you know as often people say, well, was he a robot? Well, no. Nebuchadnezzar still feels like he's making his own decisions. But look, we're making his own decisions, God. You know, it's, <laughs> you can say you're in charge all you want, but until you recognize the fact that God's really the ruler over the realm of mankind, this is going to be your condition. And so he, he has to wait it out. And then, so this happens uh, pretty quickly, verse 33, and then we'll move on here. Verse 33, uh, immediately... The word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled, and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle 
and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown out like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Okay, so he loses his mind. There's actually a uh, technical term for this. And we don't want to limit the word of God to like a, a modern medical term, but they, there is a uh, condition in which this happens. And it's, if you look it up online, they'll mention Nebuchadnezzar. Um, it's called boanthropy, B-O-A-N-T-H-R-O-P-Y, boanthropy. So anthropy, you know, is, uh, you know, man or human being, like anthropology, something like that. Uh, bow, I get, it, it's the, to fall into the state where you, uh, on a subhuman level, act like an animal. You believe yourself to be an animal. So, I mean, he, he yeah, the other, it's those creepy movements, right, that identify as animals. So, uh, but, you know, he, he descended into madness. God caused him to, to lose the control over the parts of his mind and brain that allowed for him to act normal. And so, notice here, some of the things that it describes here. He was driven away. So imagine, like at, on church on Sunday, when we all get back together, if somebody actually started acting and, and wouldn't stop, started acting like an ox or a cow, and they just would not quit. And they start, I mean, just acting just so abnormal. And, you know, just how unusual that would be. This is, and, and now imagine if, I, I don't like uh, mentioning things from a modern period because the fact of the matter is in a few years it's going to be irrelevant. But could you imagine if, uh, if Donald Trump or if a president started acting, or, or Obama a few years back, started acting like a cow? I mean, and what, how would you address that situation where a political ruler in, in a high position of power just stops doing all the things, stops being in control of himself and goes out on the front lawn and starts eating grass and just how weird that would be. And then all the problems that would that would come with that, the challenges that would accompany that. You know, what do you do? Okay. Um, and notice that he was driven away from mankind. It's not that he's just walked out there and started eating grass. He acted so strange that people are like, this guy's nuts. Get him out of here. And starts eating grass. And, and this is in Iraq. You know, the weather, it's not quite as extreme. It's kind of similar. It's a desert, you know, like out here, but not. it's a little bit more extreme than we have it. It can go from 120 degrees in the day to below freezing at certain points of the year. I mean, living outside with the clothes on your back for seven years, and I want you to think about it. Let's talk about this for a minute. I know it's a little bit silly, but it proves the point. You can think of, you know, just the humbling that this is that Nebuchadnezzar is going through. How long would our hair be and our fingernails be after seven years? No haircuts, no grooming, no washing, no showers, living outside and I mean, I don't know. Guys, our hair grows a little bit differently. You know, mine grows fast, but it doesn't grow very long. Chris, you have kind of longer hair, right? So, I, I, I don't know. Ladies, I don't, what, how long would ha hair take for you to grow? If you didn't cut it for seven years, what would happen? Seven long enough that we call a Rapunzel on a puzzle that found your brown hair. <laughs> You'd be a Rapunzel? <laughs> yeah. Might have a little yeah. stubble, yeah. <laughs> Pens, yeah. I mean, I, and you could imagine without, you know, it's not like they had showers then anyway, but you could just imagine without any type of cutting, grooming, anything. So, and then your fingernails. 
I mean, how long have you ever gone? You don't really have to answer this. You can think about it. How long have you ever gone if, with, uh, with your fingernails growing out? You know, it's just, so it's just, so it says that his, it gives a description. Yeah, and his toenails too. I didn't think about that. Yeah, I mean, those don't grow as long, but I mean, <laughs> you know, there are, there are like world record books of things where people tried to grow them out. And so anyway, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, probably, uh, now he's under the rain and also, okay. His hair had grown out like eagle's feathers, so it's all matted together, and his nails like bird's claws. Okay, so he's uh, he's nuts. He's lost it. Okay, and he's eaten grass for seven years. I mean, it's like one thing. Okay, one night out there, like that. All right, but this is seven years long, so you know this would uh, that would be something. Okay, now let's look at the second point. Finish up here, last uh, couple of verses. Okay, um, he finally figures it out. God, God helps him figure it out through these events. So it's not like Nebuchadnezzar decides one day to to figure it out. He does decide. God does change him, but it's it's really if God hadn't done this, he wouldn't have changed his mind, right? Uh, but let me read verses 34 and following. It says, but at the end of that period, I, so first person language again, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my reason, my knowledge returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the, most, uh, in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand. Or say to him, what have you done? So Nebuchadnezzar has this dramatic turnaround. As I said, not every repentant sinner's repentance is recorded in the history, let alone in history in general, let alone in the Bible. We know about quite a few people, you know, how they were converted, how they were, you know, how God brought them to repentance. We have a lot of those stories in scripture as well. But the fact is, uh, most people throughout redemptive history, we don't know how God brought them to himself, how God brought them to repentance. And repentance is, you know, very precious to God. God cares about it. Luke 15, 7 talks about the rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents. So it, it's all of the repentance matters to God. Not just of important people or unimportant people. It's all of the matter. But why is this one recorded here? You know, think about that. You know, why record this? Is it be and it's not as if, and there's this, I think, area where balance is needed today. You know, this idea where someone who's famous gets saved. And I think there's, you know, people falling off both ends of the horses with that, where one, there's kind of a celebrity culture where people are like all, you know, excited for what some famous person can bring to Christianity, you know, because of their salvation. I think that's, uh, you know, an unbalanced way of thinking. I think the other side is an unbalanced way of thinking too, that, that people are, are very dismissive often of, you know, a famous person comes to the Lord and they're like overly skeptical, you know, of the fact that, you know, someone has, has turned to Christ, you know, so it's, I think that's an unbalanced way of thinking too. Nebuchadnezzar, famous individual, world history, but God brings him uh, to repentance, as I said, as an object lesson. He's an object lesson for Israel in captivity, in the Babylonian captivity at this time, that really God is the one 
who gives and removes sovereignty. And really God's kingdom and God's sovereignty is what's in charge. And Nebuchadnezzar is the one who's brought to realize that and even say those words with his own mouth. That Nebuchadnezzar is actually the one who gets to uh, teach Israel this way through the book of Daniel about the character and nature of God. That he gets to not only teach Israel, but he records it and teaches the, the world as well. This is for the Gentiles as well. This is why it's written in Aramaic that, hey, look, I am the most powerful king on the face of the earth. This is what God put me through and he was just and right to do it. And now I acknowledge that the God of Israel, Yahweh, the Most High, he's really the ruler over world history. He's really the one who is sovereign. He's really the one who deserves that, that position of unaccountable authority over everything. And I acknowledge him as the, the total ruler over world history. And, you know, if, if that's true of the person at the, the so-called the top, then that's true of everyone on down the line. And Proverbs uh, 21, 1 talks about that uh, the king's heart is, are like, is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord, that he turns it wherever he wishes. That just like the irrigation of the, the ancient world where they blocked off and built canals of water to direct it in certain ways for, for irrigation, because they don't have sprinkler systems, that type of thing, that really God's the one directing the hearts of even the king. And the argument is, is one from the greater to the lesser. If that's true of the most powerful individuals on the face of the earth, if they're not, nothing to God to control them, God can control everything else too. So God is teaching, using Nebuchadnezzar as an object lesson for uh, the Jews about the kingdom of God and God's sovereignty and the Gentiles about the kingdom of God and God's sovereignty. Um, let me give you a couple verses here to, to remember or to write down. This is before Nebuchadnezzar even comes in the Babylonian captivity. Now it's close, but in Jeremiah uh, 25, verse 9, uh, he warns them, God speaks to them and t tells them that... <laughs> I, I was going to say the north is coming for you, which is true because Babylon did attack from the north. But <laughs> I realize that sounds a little bit um, like uh, a little more like the Civil War. But anyway, he says in Jer uh, Jeremiah 25, 9, And I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. So he may be the most powerful king on the face of the earth, but he's really God's servant to accomplish God's will. He doesn't even know about God. He doesn't, you know, definitely in a personal way. Jeremiah 27, 6. Now I have given, this is God speaking, now I have given all the lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon, my servant. And I have given him also the wild animals of the field to serve him. Uh, Jeremiah 43, 10, again, calls them, uh, it says, I'm going to send on you uh, and get Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And I am going to set his throne right over these stones that I have hidden and spread a canopy over them. So Nebuchadnezzar is, is God's servant. He thinks he's doing whatever he wants, and he is. He's doing his own thing. He's accomplishing his own will. But really, he's accomplishing God's will. And Daniel 1.1 1, 1, talks about the Lord, Daniel 1, 1 through 2, talks about the Lord gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. And God even sets in Jeremiah, prophetically, the limit of time that Babylon's going to rule, 70 years, Jeremiah 25, 11, and 29, 10. So, I mean, God is directing and, and it doesn't stop with Nebuchadnezzar. All the other kings and kingdoms that follow are under God's rule as well. But Nebuchadnezzar finally realizes these things. He turns to God, he says he blesses the most high, him who lives forever. And let me just read again 
and we'll quit here in just a minute. What's his testimony? What does the most powerful king on earth, what is his final analysis and the testimony about who really rules over the kingdom of men? Daniel 4, 34 and 35. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. So this is God's dominion's permanent and eternal. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing before him. So it's an incomparable kingdom with God. But he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. So God, do we believe in free will? Yes. We believe in God's sovereign free will. God can do whatever, can and does whatever he wants. It's taught right here, Daniel 4.35. And this is not only in heaven, but on earth. That God's power is, is unlimited to these different realms. We don't really get to separate it out. And that God's power is irresistible. It's unaccountable. And that's only appropriate with God's power, not human power, because our power authority is, is under God. But God is, is truly unaccountable in his power. It says, and no one can ward off or strike against his hand or say to him, what have you done? God's power, God's sovereignty is unquestionable. And this reminded me a little bit of um, when we were in Utah. I was in Utah with a team with Kenton, there was this um, former Mormon turned agnostic atheist, which is very common. They have a, a distorted view of God that destroys their view of God from, uh, from Mormonism, and then they uh, disavow God totally through atheism. But he's very angry at, at God, um, truthfully. He hated God. Uh, he hated the God of the Bible, which he said didn't exist, so God doesn't exist and I hate him type of thing. But, uh, and I don't know if Kenton, if you remember this, but and his uh, name was Mark um, and he's a college professor and we, we had a good you know, back and forth in debate, but he, he got kind of upset, but he, he really, he was like, well, the God of the Bible, he kills people, he does these things. And what well, we're saying, yeah, but God is you know, sovereign over his creation. This is God's world that you know, man is rebe in rebellion against God. That's... <laughs> Why God can uh, destroy you know, all this stuff. So we're, we're trying to engage with them in a biblical way. And there's high school students who are kind of trying to think through, whoa, whoa you know, they never heard an atheist, you know, going against these, uh, making these arguments against, against, you know, God. And um, I remember him saying, you know, at the end of all this, in the final analysis, I hope that there's some universal police force that can hold God accountable for his crimes. And I said, do you mean God. like God? <laughs> and I, you know, and I know that sounds tongue in cheek, like a joke, but I was trying to show him the internal inconsistency of even while he's disavowing God, talking about how much he hates God, that what he's really wanting is there to be some ultimate unaccountable force for good and justice to bring all the injustice of the world and to judge it. He just doesn't want the God of the Bible. So he, he needed to, you know, he needed to repent. He needed to change his mind. But the God of the Bible is really, uh, is unaccountable in his power. And, this, and that's a good thing because he's just goodness and the definition of goodness comes uh, from God. And in this, we really see, I think, the, uh, the limitation or the fatal flaw in, in human, uh, human authority and human government. And uh, I'll put it this way and we'll, we'll quit here. One of the most famous statements in American government, James Madison says, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Right, the internal flaw in this. Now, James Madison's a genius, okay, but 
the internal flaw in that is, but we don't have angels to govern us. We have men governing other men. So if we can't trust, you know, if, if we're not to be trusted, you always have a situation where you have an authority problem. You have humans trying to rule, or, rule over other humans, so the, the authority always uh, has to be limited. And it has to be limited under the ultimate rule, the ultimate authority and rule of God as the, the true creator and ruler. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar is brought to realize, that, that God's kingdom and God's rule is really the only one that matters. Uh, his kingdom is restored to him. Just finish off with these verses and we'll close in prayer. Verse 36. At that time, after he said this statement, my reason returned to me and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. I mean, when he came back, they accepted him. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. I mean, his kingdom was even greater than before. Verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of Heaven, for all His works are truth and His ways justice, and He is able to humble those who walk in pride. So let's uh, close with a word of prayer and then discuss uh, some of these things. Lord God, we thank You that You are able to, uh, to humble those who walk in pride. That if you're able to humble a man like Nebuchadnezzar and be sovereign over the world situation in that time, that that is no less true today and that these things that are laid, for, uh, laid down in Daniel, that we can hope for them in the future. Lord, we thank you. Um, we pray to you and acknowledge uh, your sovereignty. We, we pray that you would give us humble hearts uh, before you of, of submission to you and your will, that it comes down to uh, your will versus our will, Lord, that you'd give us the heart to choose your will and to prefer that over our own, just as uh, was the attitude of our Lord Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.